I spoke about something entirely different at Renona this morning, but I'm going to do something different again here. In our Gospel reading from Matthew this morning, Jesus tells us, and he's referring to the disciples, and that includes every single person who puts their faith in God, to go and make disciples. And yet for many of us, I think, the very thought of talking to people about our faith, about Christ, is one of the scariest things we'll ever have to face. In our minds, we often get this mental picture of having to go up to total strangers to talk to them about God. We imagine ourselves struggling over words like sanctification and atonement, trying to explain to someone why they're a sinner, feeling embarrassed and wondering inside just what they're thinking about us and our efforts. And that mental picture, conscious or unconscious, often generates a fear within us that actually paralyses any attempts we ever might make at sharing our faith. But I've got good news for you today. It doesn't have to be that way. And to help us recognise this, I want to try a little exercise. I've done this with you before, but I want to try it again. I want, and it will be a bit of a longer period for some of you, I want you to think back to your early 20s or your teenage years. So just in your mind, drift back in time to those years when you didn't wake up with a bit of a crick in your knee or something like that. Think back to those times. And when you're there, I want you to think for a mind, for a moment or two, and bring to mind the five most influential sermons or talks or addresses that you ever heard. You know, talks or speeches that had an influence on who you are today. I'll give you 30 seconds. You must have had great preachers in those days. I'm sure you're going to come up with lots. Julian. No, no, not at all. Five influential messages. See if you can think of, you don't have to name them specifically, but see if you can identify five times when you heard a message. Could have been a sermon, it might have been something in another setting where you were powerfully shaped. Yeah. Thank you. You got 30 seconds. Now, if you think about it, you hear one every week, and you've been in church for 20 years, so it's a lot of sermons. <laughs> 40 years. <laughs> Or longer? Well, not so long for others. <laughs> All right. I know I haven't, you know, roughly 30 seconds have gone by. Who came up with five sermons? <gasps> no one. What about four? Or messages? Three. Messages, talks, sermons, you know? Three. Edie got three? You got two? One? Zero? I mean, I'll, I'll do that again. Put your hands up <laughs> if you've got five or more. No one. Four? Hands up for four? Hands up for three? One, two. Hands up for two? One, two, three, four, five, six ish. Hands up for seven. Uh, for, sorry, for, for, for one? Yeah, another half a dozen. Who couldn't think of one? Oh, yeah. That's a bit disturbing, isn't it? Okay, this time, I'm gonna, we'll do the exercise again, but this time, thinking back to your early years again, I want you to, this time, remember or think of five people, five individuals, or maybe couples, who had an impact on your life. Five people who shaped who you are today. And again, I'll give you 30 seconds. See if you can think of five people who had an impact on who you are today. Is that, a, is that a quick... you got five already. Yeah. 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 All right. Who got more than sermons? Pretty much everyone, right. I mean, and, and I guess the point I'm trying to make is pretty obvious, isn't it? It's people who count. It's people who make the most difference in our lives. It's the relationships we have with people that make the difference. And if I were to go on now and ask you to think about the steps that lead to you becoming a Christian, I can almost guarantee that for most of you here today, you would point to the influence of key friends and family members upon your lives. That is the reason that you're sitting in church today. And it's a principle that you'll find is borne out as you read through the Bible as well. In the book of Acts, it's pretty clear that the conversions that immediately followed those who first came to faith, like Lydia, Philippian jailer, and others like that, were those of their immediate family and household. So it was Lydia's household that came to faith immediately after her conversion. It was the Philippines jailer's household, his family, his sons and daughters and wife that came to faith immediately after his conversion. 
And in John's Gospel, the first thing that Philip does on hearing the good news is to go and find his friend Nathaniel and to share the message with him. And when Levi the tax collector was first saved, what was his reaction? He threw a party and invited all of his tax collecting friends. <clears throat> As one church historian once put it, the primary way that Christianity spread in its early years was through the witness of ordinary Christians like you and me to those along they lived and worked alongside. And to bring it even closer to home, did you know that only half a percent, it's only one person in every 200 of people sitting in church today are there because of the influence of a, Billy, of a rally like a Billy Graham crusade or, or something like that. Only half a percent, one in 200. And usually they're actually there because someone invited them who was a friend to go to the rally in the first place as well. One percent of people in church today are there because they were visited by someone in the parish. Two percent walked in off the street. Five percent because the vicar visited. But 75 to 90 percent of people sitting in church today are sitting there because of the influence and witness of their friends and their family. 75 to 90 percent. That tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us something. It tells us that the most effective kind of evangelism is not going up to strangers on the street. It's not about going through an evangelistic speech. It's rather, it's more about recognising that the people most likely to come to Christ are those who have an already existing friendship or relationship with you. That's your friends, that's your family, that's the people you work alongside. Those are the people most likely to come to Christ because of you. It's not because you've gone up to someone on the street. It's the people you work and live alongside every single day. And to illustrate this, I want to tell you just a little bit about how I became a Christian. I became a Christian in my sixth form year at Shirley Boys High School. Um, the whole process, I, I guess, began for me about 12 months earlier during my fifth form year. During that year, my parents divorced. And things were a bit traumatic for me, emotionally, I guess. And the one thing that seemed stable in my life at that time was school, and in particular the friends I had at school. And there was one friend there in particular called Craig. And I guess Craig showed what it meant to be a genuine friend to me over that time. We ended up being best men at each other's weddings. At the time, I knew that Craig was a Christian. He didn't hide the fact in any way, and it was pretty clear that he believed in God. But he did it in a very natural kind of way, in the things that he said and the way that he behaved and so on. He never tried to push his faith upon me or anything like that. He just talked about God in the same way that we might talk about the rugby or the way in which the Crusaders beat the balls last night, you know? It was just very natural for him. But always being one for a good debate, I was always interested in what Craig had to say. So Craig and a, and a number of other Christian friends, we used to sit down and, and we used to have a little book room uh, in the school where we were at Shirley Boys High. And I used to ask them all sorts of questions, lots and lots of questions. And I used to argue, there was a guy writing you know, in those days in the 70s, a guy called Eric von Daniken, and he used to argue that spaceships came from outer space and seeded life on the earth and that Inca ruins and things were really signs of... Um, you know, pictures of astronauts and so on, but rubbish. But um, it was fun to argue this stuff with these guys. But, you know, even in the debates that I had with them, there was a sincerity with which they addressed the questions that I was asking, you know. They genuinely believed in the things that they believed in. So there was always that sort of, like, level of um, passion behind the things that they were talking about with me. It wasn't just an argument for them, you know. They believed in the things that they were talking about with with me. Later that year, during that fifth form year, I went on a 40-hour famine camp with the, uh, the Christian group at the school. They'd organised the 40-hour famine camp and they were meeting down at St. Stephen's Church uh, in, in Christchurch, in Emmett Street. And we were in the parish lounge, which was a whole lot of different rooms, and we, would, we slept in some of the rooms. And then there was this um, room down the end that was the parish lounge. And we would go there, we went there about two or three times over the weekend, and it was for a praise and worship time. Now, I wasn't a Christian at this point, but that's what everyone was doing, so I just followed along with everyone else. We sat down in all these seats, basically in a circle, and someone got out the guitar, and they started playing Christian songs, and they started worshipping God. 
and uh, the way they worshipped God was often a lot of them were closing their eyes like this and some of them were actually lifting their hands up and I wasn't a Christian but I felt the peer pressure so I went like this <laughs> and I just had one eye open and keep an eye what was going on and there was something on their faces you know there was something on their faces that said that there is something real here you know this just isn't going through the motions you know there is something real here. When they're singing these songs, it's because they have a genuine relationship with the one they're singing to or about. It was real. And I think, even though I couldn't put my finger on it, I think that was touching me on the inside. I'd probably say today that the Holy Spirit was beginning to get a grip of my heart and to draw me. We carried on after that for a few more months of, of you know debates and things. And then... In my sixth form year, we went into the into my sixth form year, and I remember sitting in a history class with Craig, and I I'm not sure if we did a lot of work in history that year, but I remember the teacher had gone out of the room, and um, and I don't know why I did it, but I just turned to Craig and I said, Craig, how did you become a Christian? And he nearly fell off his seat because I've been arguing with him for nearly a year, but I said, how did you become a Christian? So he got out a little bit of paper and he just wrote down what we would call today the salvation prayer, you know? And he just passed that to me. I put it in my folder and put it in my bag and that was it. We didn't say another thing. When I got home that night, um, and when I went to bed that night, I got out that little bit of paper and I read and in bed, <laughs> this sounds cliche, but it was in bed and under the covers with a torch, I read out this little prayer. I prayed the prayer. I said, Dear God, thank you for dying for me. You know, and Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. So I invite you into my life and I ask you to be the Lord of my life from now on. Please forgive my sins, something like that. And I didn't feel a thing. So I thought I must have done it wrong. So I prayed it again. And I took more time this time and I was really intense about what I was praying and I thought I felt a little tingle somewhere about here. So I thought, yes, I'm a Christian. But what I know now is that you don't have to have a feeling, do you? Becoming a Christian was a choice for me. It was about a shift of allegiance. It was about acknowledging that God was real and I was choosing to make him Lord of my life from that point on. And I was choosing, in a very rational kind of way for me, because it's how I am, to live my life that way from that point on. And it's been great. It's been great. Yes, I would have loved to have had more of the feeling kind of stuff. And I think a lot of us wrestle with that at times. We want to experience more of God in a personal kind of way. I know that when my brother became a Christian, he had come round to my flat because he'd been kicked out of his flat and he'd rung up and said, can I come round to see you? And I, I said, what about? And he said, oh, oh, oh Christian stuff. It wasn't really, but that's when he came round on anyway. And so he, he confessed all, but because he'd come round on that pretext, I said, well, look, we'll talk about God anyway. And we had a conversation. At the end of which, as he was leaving the door, he opened the door to leave my flat, and as he was, he stopped in the doorway, and he said to me, "Oh, how did you become a Christian?" You know, kind of like that. And I said, because I wasn't very experienced at that point, I said, um, "You've got to get down on your knees," which was probably the right thing for him because he's a very proud kind of guy. So he got down on his knees, and he said, "Well, what do I do now?" And I could have remembered that prayer, but all I could think was, "Well, to say, well, you just got to invite Jesus into your life." And so he got as far as saying the words, Dear Jesus, I need you. And he burst into tears. And I said, what's happening? You know, what's going on? And he said to me, it's like someone has turned on a tap of warm water. And warm water was just flooding over him, you know, in him and through him. Um, yeah. Mm, sorry. <laughs> So for some of us, we get the feelings, eh? But not all of us. And I guess I'm a little bit emotional about it because my brother's gone through a pretty rough road over the years where he has turned away from God. But recently, he and his um, he got remarried later in life and he started to go back to church, which is really encouraging for me. And sometimes people we love go through those journeys, don't they? You know, sometimes they're really close and then other times they're really hard. Never give up. But as I look back, I realise that there were four things that had an important part to play in my becoming a Christian. Firstly, there was the relationship I had with Craig. Craig 
was a friend. He was someone whom I knew, someone whom I trusted, and because I trusted Craig, it made it easier for me to trust what Craig believed in. And that's the main reason, or one of the first reasons, why it's so powerful to witness when friends and family members share with us. It's the key, I think, to why it makes it easier for us to believe in Christ, because we know them, we know who they are, we know whether they're faking it or not. It's not like a total stranger who tells us something. They're not just a salesman. We're people they know. Secondly, they had something that was attractive to me. On that 40-hour famine camp, I glimpsed something of another reality. I saw something that gave their lives meaning and purpose beyond the daily grind. And there was a part of me subconsciously that wanted it. Thirdly, and, and possibly... Some of us struggle with this one today. My friends at that point in their life, and they were young, were passionate about what it was they believed in. They didn't hide their light under a bowl. They didn't obscure the fact that they were Christians. It didn't mean that they Bible bashed me, because they didn't do that. But they just very naturally talked about their faith on a day-to-day -day basis, the way we talk about other things that are important to us. In the same way that Corey and Ellie are excited about the birth of their child, or you know, the coming child, you know, in the same way, we should be very naturally talking about what Christ means to us, you know, where it's appropriate, in appropriate settings, you know. You know, how was your weekend? Oh, it was great. We had an awesome time in church, you know, or, or whatever. We were on this camp or whatever it was you're doing. Don't be afraid to let Christ come into your conversation. You know, sometimes when it comes to being more open about our faith, we get cold feet because we're afraid of what other people think about us. We're afraid that they're going to think we're just some kind of religious zealot or something like that. But in those times, what I find useful is to think, how would I feel about them? You know, put the shoes on the other feet. If they were talking to me about something that was important to them, be it religious or otherwise, would I be thinking they're idiots or would I be thinking less of them because they're having that conversation with me? Of course I wouldn't. You know, we have this fear, but I think it's an irrational fear. We are afraid of what people think about us, but I actually don't think people are thinking those things anyway, especially if the people we're sharing our faith with is the ones with whom we have a natural relationship anyway. Our family aren't going to think that way about us. Our friends aren't going to think that way about us. And the final factor, the fourth factor that led to my becoming a Christian, I would argue, was God himself. You know, in our reading from Matthew, Jesus made it clear that he would not leave the disciples alone, that he would be with them to the end of the age. And you can be sure that God is working with us in the task of evangelism. On the day that I turned to Craig in my history class, I was in fact just as surprised as he was that I'd done that. I had no intention at that time of saying anything. I hadn't gone into the class thinking, I'm going to ask Craig how to become a Christian. I just found myself turning to him and speaking out of the depths of my heart. And I would say today that I'm looking back that I would say that it's the work of the Holy Spirit. That God's Spirit was at work in my heart, drawing me to that place where I got to the point where I was able to verbalize it and ask a question. The Holy Spirit works with us in evangelism. It's not all up to you. It's not all up to me. God's working with us in the task, so you can relax a little bit about it. So if it's our friends, and if it's our family, who are going to be the most responsive audience, what can we do, what can you and I do, to make that responding easier for them? And I want to note four ways that you can help your friends, your family, come to know Jesus. And the first one is to pray. Pray. Prayer, as we've already noted, recognises that we're not alone in the task, that God works with us in it. Pray and ask God to direct you maybe to just one friend or one family member. Ask God to show you the person who I guess is the most receptive or most open at this point in your life, this current time. Ask God to show you who that person is who is most likely to respond to the gospel. And then pray for that person specifically. Ask God to be with them. Pray that God would bring other Christians across their paths to open their hearts to him and so on. Pray. And you know, prayer shows the intention of our hearts. If we're not praying for people, do we really, really care about them? So ask God to show you a person who is most likely, most receptive, most open to hearing this good news. And then begin to pray for them regularly. Secondly, be a genuine friend. 
Your friendship is not to be based on whether a person comes to know Jesus. We're just called to be friends, to be genuine in our relationship with anyone and everyone. Because that's how Jesus loved people. So be open, be genuine in your friendship. Invite them to functions. You know? Invite them on things that you're doing as a Christian. You know, if you're going tramping, invite them tramping. You know, whatever it is, involve your friends in your life where they're going to actually maybe see and mingle with other Christians. You get to see that we're pretty normal. You know, we're we're normal, aren't we? We're normal? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I jump up and down at rugby, I'm normal, you know. I remember, and I may have told this story too, I remember very much being part of a rugby, tough rugby module in Auckland, and uh, we made up a team from St John students and church people, and we needed a couple of extras, and one of them was a neighbour to one of our church guys. And after two weeks of playing with us, he came to me and one of the other St John students, and he just asked us, do you drink beer? That was his question. And we said, yes, we do. And then he said, but you're normal. Like that was a surprise to him. And he said, you know, you're one of these church people, but we weren't coming, we had a stereotype of how we were meant to be, but we weren't actually like that. And so once people get to me, I hear that all the time. You know, once people get, I play paintball, right? I've got bruises to prove it from yesterday. And people find it surprising that a priest plays paintball. Some of you might not like that, I don't know, but it's fun. Um, but we be real, be genuine, you know, and people will get to meet us and understand that we are normal and then they begin to trust us and realise that we've actually got some important things to say about other areas. So thirdly, be excited about your faith. Let them see your passion for Christ in your speech, in your actions, your opinions, your lifestyle, and your friendship for them in every way possible. And if you're not excited about being a Christian, ask yourself why you're not. If you're not excited about being a Christian, ask yourself why you're not, because there's something wrong in the mix. We should be excited about our faith. And lastly, be ready to share when the opportunity arises. In 1 Peter 2.17, Peter says, We are, must always be ready to make a defence to anyone who demands from us an accounting for the hope that is in us. And yet we should do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, we should always know what it is we believe so that when someone asks a question, that we will be able to give them an answer. And there is one very simple way of doing that. You know, sometimes we're not going to have the answers to some of the tough questions that people might throw at us. And in that case, you say, well, look, I don't know the answer to that. Can I come back to you? Or do you want to talk to someone you know who might be able to give them an answer? You know, maybe to the pastor or something like that. But there is something you can do, and that is to share your testimony. To share your personal story of what God has done or is currently doing in your life, like I did this morning. How did you come to faith? You know, every one of you here will have a story about how you come to faith, won't you? You will all have a story about how God came into your life and the reason you're sitting in this church today. Every single one of you will. And it's a story that will have, I guess, four parts to it. There will be the before, you know, what was life like before you became a Christian, you know? Who were you? What were you doing? You know, what was life like before you became a Christian? And then secondly, what were the reasons? What were the things that were happening in your life that started to draw you towards looking at Christianity? And it might have been a friendship with a Christian. And then thirdly, how did it happen for you? How was it that you actually made that decision to become a Christian? And then lastly, what's it been like since? That's your story. And we've all got we've got the big testimony of how we came to faith, but we'll have lots of little testimonies of how God is at work in our lives every day on an ongoing basis. And you might be able to say, if they ask you about God and, and what it means to be a Christian, you might not be able to tell them or lead them through a salvation prayer at that point. But you might be able to say, well, look, let me tell you how it happened for me. And you can share your story with me. In your pews, I've left a whole lot of pens and a whole lot of bits of paper. We're going to do a little bit of an exercise at the moment. Nancy, can you bring up for me that one there? No, one that says testimony. How to prepare your testimony. I just want us to take... Five minutes to have a think about 
your testimony, your story about how you came to faith. So grab that bit of paper, grab that pen. If you haven't got one, put your hand up and I'll make sure you get one. There's some spare paper around. But have a think about what you're about. See if you can actually prepare, just, to, just make some notes some bullet points down of how it is that you came to faith of what your testimony is. Now for some of you, Let's say you basically grew up in church, were almost born in church, you know? That might be what's going to happen for Corey and Ellie's baby, you never know. But for some people, they can't actually identify a time when they came to faith. You know, they've always been in the church, part of the church. That's actually part of your story. I grew up in the community of faith, you would say. And this is what Jesus means for me today. So have a think about what your story might be. For some of you, you might not have a story yet. You might only be able to talk about the first two or three steps. Okay? But have a go at doing that now. Nikki's pointing out the time to me. I mean, Stuart filled in too much time with the prayers, obviously. <laughs> 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 yes, it's, it's Paul coming back at me. <laughs> so, that you, you're only just beginning that. So take it home with you, finish it off, but bring it back next week because I'm, what I would like to do over the next few months really is actually for people to share some of their testimonies, you know, just two or three minutes to share some of their story. We haven't got time to do that today, but finish it off, bring it back next week, and... Um,